Okay. Welcome everybody to the fourth panel of the Linking and Learning web series of the Tear Care Foundation. Today we are going to address the topic of um, Indigenous tourism and the inclusion of Indigenous peoples in the tourism industry. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us again. So before we get started, and before I hand over to our lovely moderator, Joost, um, I just want to um, remind everybody to mute themselves at all times, please. And we encourage you to use the live chat very actively. So if you want to make a comment, ask a question, please use the chat um, as much as possible. And we'll be answering as we go and also at the end for the Q&A. And also, please, um, we wanted to remind everybody that we have um, a little discussion session at the end of the panel for those who can stay to continue the conversations that we're going to um, start during this panel. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna pass on to Joost to get started. Super. Thank you so much, Veronica, for the introduction and welcome everyone to this linking and learning web series today. We are super excited for a really good panel and a very important subject today. Um, before we go ahead and introduce the panelists, I will just briefly run through two slides as a general introduction to the topic, therefore sharing my screen. Um, if that's happening, yes. So um, today we speak about indigenous tourism and how to include um, indigenous communities uh, economically and socially via tourism as a potential tool. Um, first of all, as a couple of general facts about uh, indigenous communities, they make up less than 5% of the world population, um, but account for 15% of the most poor. Um, while they live in all continents, they represent 5,000 different cultures and speak more than 7,000 languages, which already um, speaks to the amount of diversity and complexity and richness these cultures in, um, have. Um, they tend uh, to live in harmony uh, with nature, and it is scientifically proven that the, their lifestyle, the lifestyle of indigenous community is enhancing biodiversity wherever they um, have control over land and the assets uh, of nature um, because they live uh, symbiotically rather than extractively with um, nature. So as a matter of fact, indigenous communities are a key driver in fighting climate change and advancing uh, the very prominent UN Sustainable Development Goals. And today we really want to speak about indigenous communities, um, their, the opportunities that tourism provides for them. And therefore I have a second slide that speaks a little bit about the role of tourism when it comes to indigenous communities, uh, because it has also been discussed and debated widely what the role of tourism can be in advancing the socio-economic development of um, indigenous communities. And it has been acknowledged that tourism can be a vehicle that can help both uh, sustain the tangible and intangible elements of indigenous cultural heritage, their languages, stories, uh, traditions, and rituals in many ways, as um, they are given uh, an economic value um, through the touristic experience it's, that can be created um, together with uh, indigenous communities. So often the cultural heritage products that are developed for tourism, uh, they can provide um, socioeconomic opportunities for the communities involved if managed well and if done in, uh, in harmony and in collaboration um, with the community. So as a matter of fact, tourism can be an effective tool for realizing sustainable indigenous development uh, by making these communities really leaders in tourism and related sectors, or at least have them fairly economically participate in the touristic uh, ecosystem and in the tourism value chain. So with the opportunity comes risk. Um, indigenous communities are not always benefiting fairly. They can be put at risk and their culture can also be marketed 
at times from a destination marketing perspective or from other players in the tourism world um, without the relevant and necessary free prior and informed consent that is needed to really develop that in a um, sustainable and in a fair way. So this really quickly as um, two slides to introduce the topic of um, communities, indigenous communities and tourism. And now we are jumping to the panelists. Let me just close this presentation. We will share that with everyone um, uh, in the chat. And we can jump into the conversation. So I'm super happy um, to have three awesome panelists today. Uh, and I would give the opportunity to the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, speak a little about what they are currently doing, where they are in this, on this planet, and um, what their involvement with indigenous um, tourism is at this point in time. So um, I would give the word to Maria, um, the president of the Lima Tourist Foundation. Welcome, Maria. You're on mute, Maria. <laughs> Classic. <coughs> That's it. Um, good morning or good afternoon. It depends in which part of the world uh, you are. I hope that uh, everything is well and I mean as best as possible in these circumstances with each and each one of you. Uh, I'm Maria. Rosa Ararte from Lima Tours Foundation, a foundation that's um, the first case in Latin America that a tour operator made its own foundation. And um, we've been working uh, as, as, a, as a company for more than 60 years and with the foundation almost 20. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Maria. Great. I'm uh, uh, giving the word to Olopiro. Uh, welcome, Olopiro. Please introduce yourself for a second. Hi, my name is Olopiro Lulundin uh, from Tanzania, and uh, I'm working with the Visit Natives. Now we have like uh, two years above. We are doing this. Um, I mean, we are doing like visit indigenous people in Tanzania. So yeah, this is what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Olopiro, for joining us. We are really, really happy that you could take the time. Um, to be with us. And uh, Olopiro is working closely with Anina, uh, the founder of Wizard Natives. Um, welcome, Anina. You're still on mute, just to give you that. Ah, okay, there it is. Here we go. <laughs> hey, hi, everybody. My name is Anina Sandberg. As just said, I'm the founder of Wizard Natives. And Wizard Natives is a, a travel agency and tour operator, and we operate in Tanzania among three different indigenous communities and also in Norway among the Sami reindeer herders. So, and I'm based in Helsinki in Finland. And yeah, I'm here now together with Olopira, who is our manager in Tanzania about the indigenous and representing the indigenous communities in Tanzania. Thank you, Anina. So I think it's a good start um, to, to, to really ask you a couple of questions. Um, before we um, get into the conversation also involving Maria, like I'm wondering what is it that brought you um, to the stage of founding Visit Natives and what is motivating you to, to, to do this and, and get involved in indigenous tourism in the first place? Mm, yeah, I think they all started when I, um, I studied to, when I was a student, I studied African studies in the university and I went into field in Tanzania to do my field research and I stayed among the Maasai almost a year doing my anthropology, anthropological field work. And that experience was the best experience I had in my life. I was truly immersed in the Maasai culture. And of course, I also uh, spoke the language and Swahili and, and a little bit Ma language as well. And then when I came back home, I started to think that um, like, what, what I really want to do in my life because I felt like I want to go back. And then I started to think that there's so much um, uh, tourism that doesn't benefit local people. And in the other way, also travelers are seeking for more immersive experiences. As I said, for me, it was my best experience ever to stay with the indigenous people. 
So then I came up with the idea to found Visit Natives that is managed totally by the indigenous people and then travelers can go there because now we don't have time to spend one year in every location as to do, for example, the field research. So then I decided that maybe you can go one week to stay with the Maasai people or with the Sami reindeer herders and you can learn from them. So this is how it all started. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, um, do you think it's a, a, a really a necessary condition, like a, a pre-requirement for indigenous tourism to be managed by indigenous people? Because Absolutely. I think the only way to run sustainable indigenous tourism is when the indigenous people are in charge. So they have to uh, design and manage the tourism in their ancestral lands. And I think that's what makes it very different, that mm. Um, it has to be like totally managed by them and on their free will. Well, Opiro, um, how did you feel about that when, when Anina was approaching you? Um, and how, uh, how did she convince you that this is a good idea? Um, what made you believe in Anina's in effort? Yes, um, well, I believe her because she brings a nice things and my country and my community. So my community, they benefit from us together. And um, yeah, so that's why I believe her. Uh, and uh, people, they uh, get more uh, things from us and we would like to go moving forward to help the community. So you had good experience now uh, in the past where um, the Maasai community is also benefiting Yes, directly. yes, I have enough experience, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And and how like maybe how did that start and and how did you get into um, uh, Anina? How like how were your first experiences actually realizing that and how did you feel the um, how how did you design the actual benefit for for the community? Like what makes you looking after the the the, the beneficial aspects for the community more than others? Maybe what do you think is different there? Um, what uh, we uh, we expect from how together as visit natives that uh, we are really doing the different things with the others to operate because we are going direct to the community people and say with them our driver the Maasai they driving our clients we stay with them and meet them to go to the you know we have so many things to do mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, we are happy that uh, we made it and people, they like what we are doing because we help uh, indigenous people. Um, switching to Maria in that sense, before we go back to this conversation, because it's interesting that we'd have two examples. We have um, Tanzania here uh, as well as Peru. And um, what we have just said is like the importance of um, um, such indigenous tourism experiences being managed by indigenous communities. Um, is that something um, that you have seen in Peru uh, as well? Do you, did, did you see examples um, that uh, worked out uh, well? Or is the, let's say, the ecosystem of indigenous tourism growing in Peru as it is in many other um, destinations? Uh, actually, it started in, in, in Peru. It took a, a bit to start. I, I think that Africa uh, was uh, did us all in, in the world, probably. Um, we had already outbound tourism going to Africa, for example, and, and they came and said that their experience was great. And community tourism started to develop just like 10 years ago in, 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 in our country. So we were quite uh, visionary, I mean, not visionary as, as a, in, in the world, but visionary in, 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 in Peru, because it's, it's difficult to do it in Peru. Our geography doesn't help. Um, communities are very far away, almost no roads. So, so it took a bit to develop and to choose which community we wanted to to go to. Um, the area was, I mean, we thought that the area was great because it's the only Inca, um, um, inher I mean, in inheritance, the, the only Inca com community. I mean, 36 communities that live in a district. 
those 36 communities are descendants from the Incas. So um, it was very interesting to start working with them. They are very fond and, and of, of their traditions, very coherent with their values. Uh, and it's been a great experience so far. Mm. And speaking of the challenges, because that's an, a very good point also why indigenous tourism might not always be a very easy, let's say, business case in, in tourism because of infrastructure, because of how do you actually reach the community and how do you develop also a, a good working relationship. Speaking of language barriers, for instance, as we have heard in the beginning, um, 5,000 different cultures represented by indigenous tourism speak 7,000 languages. And I know of many um, different destinations where so many different languages are spoken. For instance, in Tanzania, how, how many different languages these uh, indigenous communities do, uh, do they speak? Um, so uh, it needs somebody to be able to communicate um, in the first place. And secondly, you need to have a good uh, infrastructure. So is that something um, that you have found uh, a, a, to be a challenge? And what other challenges have you have you seen in order to, to set a good starting point for, for indigenous tourism? Um, Maria, please start and then we go um, to Olopiro and Alina. Def definitely, it has been quite a challenge. Um, in, in, in our communities, they speak in that area of Peru, they speak mostly Quechua. So yes, when we, when we got in, it was very difficult and we had to take a guide, a local guide that could translate. Uh, almost, I mean, uh, of, of the 500 families, just the, the, the father, the pater of the family, uh, he, was, he was the one speaking Spanish because he was the one, the, they, it's a community where the carriers for the Inca Trail uh, the people that help carrying, thing, carrying things uh, live. So at that time, he would leave for two weeks, for example, and, and the family would be uh, left alone. The, mm. the, the, the woman just starting to, to um, take, care of the take care of the whole family and, 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 and starting to do some um, like handicraft, but only for their use their dresses are amazing. So they, they, they just like uh, households mostly, but nothing to be active, economically active. Mm. So, and their sanitary uh, uh, con conditions were awful. There um, almost no education. So it was, a, there was a lot to do. Anina, can you, can you resonate with this? Do you think this is a, a perspective that you have found as well in Tanzania or was the experience different when it comes to the development of, of the experiences? Yes, and for us, it has been always very important to uh, bring the tourism in of the beaten path, let's say like to really uh, rural remote locations. And of course, when we go to remote locations in Tanzania, it's it's different. I mean, we don't have flushing toilets, hot water. I mean, everything is it's quite basic in the infrastructure. Infrastructure. So we have to um, um, we have to adapt to that. But I would say it's like a trekking style. But of course, we have um, we have to have some like um, standards. But then we have to work with the indigenous communities to get together. And like, for example, in some Maasai villages, we have built um, toilets. And it's not only because for the um, our travelers, it's for the whole community. So then when we go to remote village, uh, we build a toilet that, and we show maybe an example that it's a good for the community. So then it's the win-win for both because it's something that um, other people benefit. So, and I think the other aspect is also educating travelers to see that not everywhere in the world you have all the communities that we are used to, like water is scarcity and um, no electricity, no roads. So they are challenges, but they are also like, um, I think, educative and also it's a natural experience, something that um, in the cities and the Western modern world, we, we don't know anymore. So mm -hmm. mm, it has both sides. That is really a good point. I, I think like there's an educational aspect or um, when um, when doing indigenous tourism that is going both ways. 
uh, you know, education wise, uh, the participating communities benefit, but even more so the clients learning something new and learning um, about um, uh, something else, but a, a very warm um, and easy, uh, like European reality, for instance, that where everything infrastructure wise, at least is, is taken care of. Um, so is that something that uh, you have seen did the, the clients react positively to? Did you do some educational work together before you go on the trip? Like, how do you make sure that the expectations are uh, like uh, in line with what they are going to, to see? And how do you put things also in perspective for, for the clients? Yes, and always um, before our travelers book our trips and before we departure to the field, we, we tell we tell in details what 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 there will be, do we have what kind of facilities, and it's more like, let's say, um, trekking trip in a way that you would go hiking, so uh, they get all the details, and I mean, it, it's, it will not be a surprise when you arrive that, and most of our communities are so remote and rural, so there's no electricity, no roads, no, I mean, it's, it's the whole, um, whole concept that we have built also in Norway with this army, so it's something we of course we tell to people in advance and then mm. Mm, yeah interesting um and like ulopiro in in terms of tourism is that something that your community like maybe you can share a couple of words how you think um, um about tourism and and uh, what your experiences were do do you do you like it do you think it uh, in the future, you would like to do more of it? And uh, what is it that you would like to maybe change? Or what is it the challenge, something that is not so easy for, 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 for you at the moment? Um, but also, how do you, how do you, how does it make a difference for you? Does it, do you have, do you, can you think of the benefits that it bring? Um, yeah, we are happy that uh, to receive the tourists you know villages and uh, to help the community. So we are really like, and I mean, we are changed, like we know new things and uh, new way to meet with the different people and people that are happy with what we are doing. And people also, they're happy. I mean, they didn't ask people that we're gonna meet them. They're happy to bring the people because they benefit from visit natives. So, Mm -hmm. And also we train our guides from the village, like chefs and drivers. And, and how do they benefit? How is the community benefiting exactly? Like, do you have an example? Um, for example, when we are going to the village, also we are doing like hiking safaris with the donkeys. So the warriors, they can take the donkey so they can get the money from this hiking safari. Also, we pay hospital for them. We we have some kind of things that the women we can support them to make it for our touristy. So visit natives, they buy those stuff to give the tour. I mean our clients. So they benefit from that things. Mm. Yeah. So they're really happy to to talk with us. So yeah, we are doing a nice thing. And, and if you now let's assume um if you had an advice to other indigenous communities and in, in how to think about that and how to think about tourism, what would you tell them? You know, what would you tell them? What should they be care? What should they well, think of and how should they do it? Are you okay? What I'm thinking about the other, let's say, indigenous people or others, I think it's good the uh, tourists, they come to the village and then people they benefit from tourists. Hmm. Mm. And is there something is there a special way um, in, in terms of how do you how do you do it how do you deal with the muzungus you know <laughs> how do you do it like do you have a specific um, suggestion uh, and how they um, uh, should plan it and yes. how it can, can they can con take control of it sorry like do you have a suggestion and how the indigenous communities should approach it like how they can take control of the the process um and what would be your what would be your advice oh i think we lost olopiro anina you can jump in if you like okay yeah 
Well, um, I would like to say, like, we also, just to add on the Olegra's comment, that uh, in addition that the indigenous people get, like, um, income and salaries, we also invest in a broader community. So uh, even those who are not hosting our travelers, the broader community get benefits because we, we buy, like, health insurance for, for all the families in the area. So then when we have visitors, not only um, those who host us is the broader community. And I think that's important, like maybe to get some advice would be when um, involving indigenous communities, it should be, uh, I mean, benefiting all the community and not only those maybe who are guides or who are planning or mm. trying to think about the whole community and their well-being and cultures in, in a broader picture. Thank you. Um, Maria, do you think, um, is there a similar design um, in Peru where you give back to the community and not only in terms of participation, so meaning the development maybe even of products, but also having some social investment that is being done from the money that is being earned via the, um, via the touristic experience that you give it directly back into the community, via training, via infrastructure, or via, for instance, co connectivity as we always Uh, experience also the rural urban technology divide knowing that rural areas have less um, like IT and connectivity infrastructure I mean we we uh, we develop them to be sustainable in every sense uh, let's uh, what, what I'm I'm saying is that um, they are doing the things by themselves now and the incoming tourism that they that they get and the groups are not just from Lima tours they opened to uh, to other ones uh, because there, there there was a way for them to have more um, uh, I mean to have a, a better performance uh, commercial commercially wise they have been since the very beginning we 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 help them um, developing their their leadership you know empowering them uh it was very important to to let the, i mean to let them know that the incas were very good in structure in organizing structure but the women didn't feel so sure of themselves and and we worked a lot uh with that and we mm. we we just um they they associated themselves for handicrafts We now have four associations of handicraft women, almost a hundred, doing uh, great things. We help them with um, uh, uh, funds, funding, but funding in the sense of of the finishing of the pieces of the of the um, design to to mm. make a research of iconography that's really of the culture of, of not just the, the, the whole Indian culture, but their uh, spe specific culture. And um, I mean, they've, they've been great. Once I think that was an, a really a good example what you just said, because we, we also, we want to know like, how can we increase the economic participation of indigenous communities through tourism? How can we make them benefit more? Um, and you said you are training women specifically in a certain skill. Um, is that uh, like that? Can you tell us a little bit more of what? Who well, is doing one that of the things and, that, and how that has that been done? Develop is is um, uh, their houses. You know, we have 34 houses. We 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 could select among them the, uh, the ones that had the best. You know, like in more than the best house because they're all the same. Um, like free room to be able to rent it. And we 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 gave them skills in HACCP for the for the the the, the all the um, um, nutrition and and uh, just the the sense of hosting you know uh, mm -hmm. hosting in their own way uh, as, as as they are but learning little details that that people would would like um, to live the authentic experience but to have the minimum comfort. So especially bathrooms, uh, for example, they, they, the sanitary, the minimum sanitary conditions for a, for an, uh, a tourist to, to be there. And they, they, they love it. And, and we put a, a, you know, in, in, the, in the door, there's, there's the, the, the name, you know, Jacinta and Leopoldo, 
that's that's their house and they're hosting people mm. and and it's it's a great experience because they do what they do every every single day they really live with them you know if they are going to to work the land if they are going to to be in the common uh, dining room or to be in the trout farm um all I'm, the I'm, I'm curious um, because it's interesting and it's great to hear that you do, that you invest so much also in, in, in building that infrastructure for them to receive uh, tourists and uh, have uh, like necessary standards in place that are necessary for a good touristic experience. Um, I'm super curious, how do you design the, the, the collaboration? Like how is the community represented? Is it one person? Is it a committee? Um, how do you actually, you know, find um, a healthy and good uh, conversation Uh, in which they are well represented and you have the feeling you take on their interests, their consent and um, uh, everything that is necessary on board in a, in a good way. We found the, the, the people, I mean, uh, uh, we started going very frequently and, and knowing the people and just, you know, you start in like like all of us do in our organization. So when you have uh, uh, interviews with people, we started knowing which ones were the most, that had the leading, you know, like uh, um, capacity in within them. And uh, and uh, we, we started giving a lot of um, 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 coaching, you know, mm -hmm. like personal coaching and, and professional uh, coaching for them to, to to develop that capacity and to and to you know th themselves we were saying how would you organize this you know and and they said well we have to have a, a young association so they chose a, a great actually a great uh, president of the young Inca association and then we have the ladies we have to make the cooperative for the for the handicraft And, mm. and we so you have, have, to have, have a, founded associations and cooperatives to formalize the, the representation? Yes. And, and they are formal, which in our country is really difficult, you know, formal meaning economically formal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, they, they learn that they have to do invoices and, 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 mm. and of course we help them with the, with the uh, techn technicality. Mm. We help mm. them get line they didn't have internet and 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 we um the amazing thing is that actually they once they 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 did it they are very strict i mean they put a, a, some rules that have to be followed and if somebody doesn't follow in the next for example uh reservation they won't be all the reservations they receive are given by turns right But if somebody does anything, the smallest thing that is not what they agreed to do, then in the next next round, they won't get the reservation. <laughs> they just skip one. So <laughs> they're really very, very strict among them. And so once uh, we, we put the pillars with them, um, to tell you the truth, everything just goes on. We, 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 we don't have complaints. It's one of the. It's one of the only, actually, you know, probably the only um, excursion full day tour that that we have. That it always exceeds exceeds expectations, uh, uh, or or even if it's a three day uh, stay there, exceeds expectations. They are fully, you know, uh, visitors come really, really. They are thrilled, and and no complaints at all. Okay, great. I think one key takeaway here is really, um, which is important, is the, the, the aspect that you mentioned, the formali formality of uh, the organization. So commu uh, indigenous communities need to found cooperatives, they need to found associations to be able to economically also participate and benefit um, in, in order to, for instance, make revenue in order to be officially registered and, and um, uh, eligible um, To be paid for the for the services that that they also provide, and that's not always the case, unfortunately. Um, Anina, I would ask you, uh, how do you approach this problem, or let's say the challenge of um, formalizing, uh, and how wh what do you think worked well for you in the past? 
Okay, for like uh, like us in Tanzania, we the local Maasai, and we have found it like we said, native world quite limited. It's like majority owned by indigenous people. So then I think it's about like managing and having, and also as you said, like founding these um, like organization and travel agencies by themselves, then they can have more access to revenue and really control the tourism. So that is how we also work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is like, if we want like to put out the vision of, um, we want to make and empower indigenous communities to become leaders, to become really developers and much more active players in the tourism value chain and in the tourism uh, world to benefit from it. Um, how do we take it a step further or not we, like how do we develop the tools and create the forums and the networking for um, uh, for indigenous uh, communities to become the leaders that that we would uh, like to see. Um, uh, and, uh, Anina, do you have like uh, ideas or do you work on, on that subject specifically outside of Visit Natives to advance the indigenous um, community sustainable development agenda, let's say? Yeah, so let's say like the role of Visit Natives is to sell and market to help to get, you know, the, uh, the products sold and then we do the marketing and maybe uh, educating or planning with the quality standards, but the indigenous people are those who, who take control of the product, who design and manage and uh, price, make the price over their product and mm -hmm. tell them how much, I mean, it's, it's all about them to creating and making the product. So we are just like a selling channel but of course we are all we are like visit natives all together but it's it's the way to give them like in power and they are those who manage so it's very important and i think that's lots of tourism that is maybe safe is sustainable indigenous tourism but then we have to ask like what is the what are the standards and how much the indigenous people really benefit so that is something that we work every day to make sure that the indigenous people benefit most um, and let's say right now we're in the middle of a global pandemic we all know that uh, tourism is is highly challenged and basically uh, at some version of standstill right now um, but looking at the time before the pandemic and at the same time looking into the future um, of a post-pandemic uh, re reality do you think indigenous community uh, indigenous tourism is becoming more and more relevant in terms of demand are more and more people interested in doing that because we are, we know that there is a trend towards more authentic and local experiences when it comes to to activities and and, and tourism um, is that something that you that you see um, uh, similar do you think there's growth in this indigenous tourism market that's it i would give that question to uh, anina first and then we go to olopiru and maria Yes, absolutely. And I think like um, things are changing. People are looking for more authentic experiences and like um, something that can uh, like you can really immerse yourself. And we also like to see like you can really maybe change your life the way you think to experience something very different. I mean, in this, we also have to think about not only pandemic, but climate change. So maybe you travel less, but you do more meaningful trips, more ethical and conscious. And then I think that is like uh, what appeals uh, to travelers to come with us to, to do something that makes also difference in their lives and in the indigenous mm. people's lives. Can you give me one example of like, let's say a customer that came out of this experience and, and had like a, a revelation or changed his or her mind to some extent? And, and what was this about? Yeah, I think I'm so happy we have like many customers who have come back like three times to one um, in, in Norway and also in Tanzania. Like they are coming back because they see they have built connection. And I think it's all about us as human beings. We need connections. We have to build like a genuine connection to other people. And when we travel because we really... Um, the indigenous people take control over the tourism. So when they reserve guests, they are not tourists. They are like, I mean, the hospitality that the indigenous people have, it's enormous. But, so they are having like members of the family. 
And it's so, it's so beautiful to spend time. And there's even one more aspect is about the nature. And as I told us, the time of the climate change, because the indigenous people live in balance with nature. And we stay with those indigenous communities that are really still traditional and living their traditional livelihood. So people get in, in contact with nature. And then with this hospitality, hospitality, they feel something that changed their, they feel like they want to come back to meet the family, to spend more time in the nature, to spend more time with those hosts. And I think that's the beautiful power of um, truly immersive, sustainable indigenous tourism. Thank you, Anina. Olopiro, I'm wondering, like, have you seen um, many Maasai um, uh, being involved in tourism? And does that happen more and more? Uh, and uh, what do you think about it? Is it becoming more and more popular among Maasai people to be involved in, in tourism? Yes, we have some of them, but uh, not a lot. So they just uh, drive out to our guys, but we uh, have very few number of Maasai people mm. in tourism, but now they come up to do these tourist things, yeah. And why and, why is that? Um, because um, you know the Maasai people for previous time they not going to school and now they going to school and uh, they try to do things to do and uh, I think why they do tourism because they know so much nature than other people like we grown up in Gorongoro conservation area and I know much about my village and. Um, I will explain everything about my village because I'm a native Maasai from there. So we love nature and that's why most of Maasai people, they want to be guides, yeah, to to drive the tourists, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, um, I, yeah I think that speaks uh, again a little bit to the growth of indigenous uh, tourism and the demand. Um, Maria, is that something that um, you can confirm for Peru as well? Definitely, definitely, almost as, I mean, very much like uh, uh, they said, yes, people, people love the experience and, 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 and it's a growing uh, um, area of, of inbound tourism and local, local tourism as well. Hmm. I think that the interesting aspect is also, as again, coming back to the theme of the panel, like the economic participation um, is relevant here and has really positive effects on the, you know, um, for instance, the, the climate change aspects, like supporting indigenous communities means supporting the fight against climate change. It means supporting rural development. It means so many positive um, things that come out of this experience. Um, besides like, uh, you know, the, the mind shift that is taking place uh, among the client to like unlearn some of the stereotypes that they uh, were brought up with, for instance, in Europe um, and, and see really new perspectives and, and, and put things in, into perspective. So um, I think that is, that is really um, like an encouraging um, learning for me from this panel that we see more and more demand um, but also that challenges have to be met and addressed in terms of uh, infrastructure in terms of also capacity building of indigenous communities to interact with um, tourists um, and the capacity building needs to go both ways again it also needs to you know also the the guests and the clients you need to build the capacity for for them to um, to kind of be um, good guests, I would say. Um, so that's that's really uh, interesting. We are starting to collect also questions. So the audience, please feel free to ask questions um, in case you, you have any, if you have a specific questions to a certain panelist, please address them directly in the comments and chat. Um, we will happily take those on board. Um, we have 15 more minutes before we go into the breakout session where we divide the audience in two rooms. Um, well, speaking of COVID, we cannot have this panel without speaking uh, about the global pandemic. Unfortunately, that is always troubling us these days. So I would like to know how uh, Olopiro, how, how did you experience um, the coronavirus pandemic and how did that change um, your work um, ever since the beginning of this year? 
Yeah, I mean, um, coronavirus that uh, is from everywhere in the world. So we don't have to worry that well. But, you know, in Tanzania that we are safe now, I mean, for a little bit, a few months ago, we have coronavirus in Tanzania, but now we are safe and um, some of people they travel in Tanzania, so they see Tanzania is more safe than other places. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good to know. And uh, yeah, so but no tourists uh, at the moment, uh, obviously, um, because of that. Or do you have people from Tanzania traveling to? Um, um, we received a few number of tourists, you know. So let's say. We Uh, Anina, if you want to jump in, feel free. <laughs> so, yeah, so now it's like in every destination we have, we follow the country's protocols and like Tanzania is welcoming visitors. So we have a small amount of people visiting Tanzania and also in Norway, like if um, we follow all the safety rules and we have our COVID-19 protocol, also the safety cards for ourselves, so how we work. So we go in, we follow those and I think the pandemic Still, we it's we just have to cope with it. So we try to mm. work in a way that is possible in a safety way. Ole Piro, you're back. Good to see you again. Um, Maria, please also chip in um, if you you are on mute, my dear. Wait a second, I'm, I can unmute you. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, actually, for it's been very, very hard for them and, and for us in, in, in the sense of, of the, how difficult it was, you know, to accept that um, all their activities have to do, have to do with that. Um, they, they are not, you know, uh, uh, with, like in the whole world, no? If, if you were doing some having cultivating some trout for the restaurants well the restaurants didn't have didn't have people uh, if you were selling handicraft to the tourism there's no tourism um and and and, and the houses didn't work uh, so the the whole thing it was uh, very very difficult and we've been totally close for many months so um and we had a very very challenging period where one one community got a, 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 a passing by person that that left the COVID, and um, they were totally they had a lockdown and they couldn't even go to their land to to cultivate their own food. So we had to manage to get some some human humanitarian aid there, and and that helped a lot. Mm. Uh, we reached uh, one thousand and one hundred households and, and and that was great but one thing that has been very very positive is that um they 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 convinced i mean they they accepted they realized that it was a moment for them to get you know like better organized to advance a lot in education we've been we've been um able to to connect with another association. I think that it's very important, the, the networking when you work with communities, because there are so many needs that you need the international community for funding. You mm. need uh, other associations, you know, uh, you need national entities, you need the ministries to be, to be aware of, of, of the problems and to, and to be a bridge uh, for them to communicate those those problems so especially in 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 these months what what we have been able is to do some of that linking that when you have a lot of of, of volume uh to to attend hmm. there is no not that time no okay yeah that. i understand and it's very much in the spirit of uh, i think you're describing exactly what we are doing the linking and learning in times of crisis and you take the time to reflect and to learn and to to connect to new people um 
There was one question from uh, Rinka, um, who, uh, which is addressed, I believe, to you, Maria. So who took the initiative to involve the communities? Was it uh, on your end? Was it basically the communities? Did they reach out to you saying, you would like no. to become more involved in the tourism uh, sector? We would like to do this and that and the other. Or was it you guys reaching out to them? How did that work? Yes, no, definitely. Definitely it was, it was, it was us because uh, part of our social responsibility program, which was, you know, we, we had already that going for uh, many, many years before. And, and we, we had started working with communities, but more in an assistance way, you know, mm -hmm. not, not, not being, I mean, not helping them be their own, uh, 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 that's where the sustainability ingredient comes, right? So, so we, we, we thought actually the leader of, of, of the company, my, my brother Carlos, he's, he's the one that started it very actively and, and, and thought that that was, that was the way to go. And, um, and we chose that one, especially the Wiyok community, the one that I was mentioning, because um, of this, you know, we, we were having a lot of, of groups doing the Inca Trail. So then we, we said, but when you are abroad, I mean, when not abroad, but when you're out from your house, how do you leave the community going? Because the, the, the Inca culture is very, a much a very masculine I mean um, uh, a lot of a lot of the load goes into 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 the man as as leading and as as a mm. provider of the economics especially I mean the woman is actually the one that has that has most of the load of the of the house and and, and, and the farming and mm. all of that but economically uh, it was it was almost only the man so uh, that's how that's how it started, you know. We we mm. we thought that there was a lot to 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 be done. Actually, there are so many communities in Peru and so much to to be done. But just to finish in this in the COVID time, that one thing that has helped them a lot is that we were able to put the handicrafts in a in a web in a in a marketing web of handicrafts of Peru with the Ministry of Culture. So, um, I just want to um, um, talk about one point because it came up a second time now. Um, so uh, I think we speak we spoke about like how can we increase the economic participation. One was okay, we need form to formalize you know um, via cooperatives, via associations for the the communities to kind of take part in this eco economic circle or cycle. Um, then secondly, the gender equality part, like building that capacity for females, um, for women to kind of join um, the the activities, the tour tourism activities, to sell crafts, for instance, or to be part of um, of a guiding experience or uh, of any other service or product development. Um, that I think. Um, seems to be also a very important aspect of, of you know, increasing the economic participation of uh, the indigenous communities. Um, Olopiro, is that something that you, that you think is, uh, is that co correct? Do, do you guys also involve um, um, uh, women um, more in the tourism uh, experience or how do you see this point of, um, of female involvement in, in, in your work? I think we lost him, unfortunately, but Anina, I'm sure you can step in. <laughs> okay, yeah, for us, it has been um, like priority because we work in many um, pastoralist communities and of course, the, like uh, females don't have so much access to have income than the men. And then we have, we try to work with very vulnerable groups. And now we are so happy we have expanded the uh, host families who are widow women. So for widow women, it's um, it's very difficult to be in a pastoralist community when you don't inherit, and maybe it's very difficult to have additional income. So now we have a, like widow host families in Maasai and Datoka communities. So uh, we are very happy that we reach them, and they are so happy to reach, to host travelers. Then we also have like school girls who are school dropouts and. We try to work with um, the most vulnerable women mm. 
Yeah. That is super interesting. Does that conflict with the values of the indigenous community sometimes? Like, do you need to kind of, you know, negotiate, discuss and, 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 and be strict about this perspective? Because in a traditional um, a system of an indigenous community, it might not be culturally acceptable for, you know, a, a woman to advance in that sense or to break those rules. Yes, and as uh, in everything we do, it's all planned and managed by the indigenous people themselves. So we are like I'm the I'm the only non-indigenous person, and I'm not um, bringing my like uh, views to them. It's like their community. Like for example, now Olabiro uh, doesn't maybe have an access, so he would maybe tell that like he's a Maasai. Then they have like a woman meeting or Maasai elders meeting. Then all other things are represented in the community. So we cannot do something that is not um, like accepted by the community. And indigenous communities work in a way that um, they share everything, everything is community-based. So they talk and they share the things. And when they show the green light, then we go forward. And then we find these families that are like, for example, led by a widow uh, woman. And then they just host the travelers as we do in other uh, families. And yeah, and normally, of course, they are like um, um, brothers, male children, and of course, there are men around, and then it's the whole community after all. But then we give the uh, benefits also for the women. So after all, everything goes hand in hand with the mm -hmm. community uh, being uh, involved in every step. Super interesting. Um, I think it's uh, five, four minutes before we do break up the audience into two breakout rooms. So everyone, please stay on the line if you want to keep on uh, sharing some thoughts and discuss the, the, the topic a little bit. Um, again, um, since we have four minutes left, like we spoke about formalization, we spoke about gender equality. What else do you think is important to uh, and advance um, this uh, indigenous tourism and to make sure that indigenous communities benefit accordingly um, and there is no exploitation taking place. So despite those two things that we talked about already, what else comes to mind? What would you recommend and what can you share with us today? Uh, for me, it's very important for them to learn about other communities, you know? So uh, uh, what we have done with the leaders is um, of the community to be able to share their experience and to learn from other communities experience from other places. So for example, in the, um, there's been events of, of, com of uh, community tourism in Latin America. We have um, made an effort and sent the leaders in different moments so that they learn from other places and they do like benchmark let's say of of what other countries are doing and um, it is amazing because now for example i'm learning important things from anilina and olipiro and um, some things are very similar but some others just enrich your uh, you know what what you could do and it's very very important for them to see that for them to not not for you to tell them, but for them to to leave that linking and learning experience. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anina, do you agree? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's very important and wonderful idea. And uh, one thing that I would like to add, I always talk about both side experience that we are giving on both sides. So the travelers always. Um, learn something. So when they stay with indigenous communities, maybe when they came back, they get like climate change education. And also they start to think about the way they consume and how they live. And I mean, they get ideas that maybe they didn't think about before. Like if you work with a woman to fetch water for five hours, you start to think that it's not a quarantine that you have running water and you know, all these small things that you can change your way how you consume and think about the planet but also in the other way for the indigenous communities like as i said we buy these health insurance but then we realize it's not enough i mean if you have to also teach the value um, when you need to seek help when the indigenous maybe natural healing is not enough so then um, we give them also like education to um, seek help in modern um, like health facilities when you need it. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. 
I think that is an interesting example as well, the uh, social entrepreneurial approach here, because you do organize, like you manage a little bit the sales, you organize clients, right, who have high purchasing power, they come from um, um, high income countries. So the that kind of transfer of money to the, the entity that is then receiving it is, is one thing, but then also to actually give something back and purchase this health insurance buy some uh, or help constructing infrastructure is really an important aspect that supports the uh, indigenous agenda that supports the indigenous tourism and therefore i think that is something that should maybe not even be called you know social entrepreneurial but it should be like the the way of doing it like the entrepreneurial way to be actually um, investing in, in the natural assets in the community to be able to like, grow in the future and make it even better. And I, I fully agree the, 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 the point um, of client education and unlearning stereotypes and, and really I would add the, the, the recycling as well. You know, uh, the, the, the experience of an, um, is starting a little eco uh, a circular uh, economy so that's that's something that that does help because for example what we're doing is is um, uh, giving for for a, a material to work some leather that came out from the seat the seats of the of the trains you know mm -hmm. we, we spoke with the train companies and we said when you change the train i uh, uh, the, the your your um i mean what covers the seats uh uh please give them and and it, it was it was great actually because you know they they could they had um, they could do different things that you, uh, combine the leather with their textiles and and they had amazing items. Okay, interesting. Yes, thank you, thank you for attending. Uh, please sign up for the next uh, linking and learning web series. We have still three more to go. And I, of course, thanks to the panelists. I didn't say that explicitly, but it was awesome to have you. And I hope you stay for the breakout rooms. I, I can imagine that there are still questions asked to you guys.